Okay, so we're gonna get started. So everyone, please find a seat. Thanks for coming back from lunch. And uh, just to start the first uh, uh, afternoon session of a snow mass, this will be a mostly uh, uh, informational session. It will be chaired by myself and Asekar. And uh, what that means is that you're not supposed to be asking any questions after the talks are done, but you're welcome to ask questions in the Google Doc and the speakers will get back to them uh, after they're done with their talks. That's the plan. Uh, one quick message for the speakers. Please try to be on this area of the, of the auditorium five minutes before your talk is coming because we want to make sure that the transitions are more or less fast. And I will try to keep the time as best as I can. And I hope I didn't forget anything. But uh, uh, the first speaker is uh, Jing Long Zhang from uh, Argon. He's, he's, he's going to be telling us about what the instrumentation frontier has in stock for us. OK, thanks. So since all of you just come back from lunch, so we made sure this talk does not have any technical detail. But I just to show you, you during this whole week where you'll find those technical details, this and that discuss. OK, so together with uh, my co-conveners, Bill Barbio from Duke, Petra Merkel from Fermilab, we just give you a brief introduction about the work plan of instrumentation frontier in this week. Okay, instrumentation frontier is about to we try to understand the detectable technologies and R and D needs for from all the science frontier, the cloud physics, neutrino physics, intensive physics, or a rare process frontier and the cosmic frontier. So uh, then we divide those all the technology needs in different areas in the different topic groups. Certainly, we also need to take care of those uh, cross, uh, cross topic, uh, you know, the overlap. Of course, if some of those technology uh, involve other fields beyond high energy physics, we also pay attention. Okay. I list our wiki link over there. You certainly can find over the description of our frontier. More importantly, mailing lists, Slack channels, you know, uh, Google links for you to provide your input to our frontier in this week. Okay, we have 10 from the frontier topic groups. So the numbering is historical, so certainly it's not necessarily logical. Start with F1 is a quantum sensors, F02 is a photo detectors, and three is a state, solid state detectors and a tracking. Uh, trigger and a DAC is F4, micro pattern gas detectors, I, oh, sorry, sorry. I have five, uh, five and I have six is a calorimeter. Uh, I have seven is electronics ethics and the uh, novel elements I have eight. Then we have uh, I have nine to take care of the cross cutting and the system integration. And the radio detector I have 10 add little, come a little bit later. So we have two to most of topic group have three conveners and some have four and two. So this all the people did have been doing heavy, heavy lifting in the whole process. And we also have some conveners early, they have to step, step down during the heavy uh, commitment in other areas before, you know, after they did the excellent work. So we also have important liaisons because instrumentation, instrumentation frontier is a technology frontier. So we, have, we need to basically communicate with other frontier, big science frontiers. We have a high level by directional communication between frontiers. Those, we have those experts have XP and experience in both frontiers. You can imagine we ha almost have a line of every frontier. So you might have discussion as a future detector and needs for any frontier for linear glider or FCCHH. We discuss, of course, you know, like the uh, uh, machine, machine and detector interface with accelerator frontiers. We discuss I machine learning, you know, with cosmic frontiers. We discuss like a, a quantum sensor technology facility with uncross basically we have all, certainly we also have early career uh, representatives in our frontier to take, you know, it's a very important aspect for the study. Okay, during the process, there's two important documents that came out. Uh, uh, I assume all of you know, one is the DOE detect R&D BR report that come out the last year. So that's already, you know, that because did excellent work the community. So our frontier basically is a build all that research plan already presenting the report, then we start developing and refining those further and for in also include some area missing at the frontier. I certainly will not read through the, the key message, but just highlight the one thing is this is trans, transformation 
discovery in science is driven by innovation in technology. This is one of the key set, the opening statement in that report. The other document that come out is last year, the ECFA detect the R&D roadmap. This is another excellent document uh, we, can, we, we are using in our frontier studies. Again, I will not read the, read the information. This section come from the first paragraph of the introduction of the document. Clearly, you can see the message that enable future particle physics experiments to achieve the most accurate measurement possible in the fundamental target of the proposed uh, detect technology only in this report. Hopefully our report, you know, also produces similar information. Okay, similar to other frontiers, it has been a long way come to this step. So uh, we have more than 300 letter of intent. So a bit, by the way, I gave the link for all the information. If you want to look at the detail, you can click those links. So we end up basically few white papers topic group. So uh, those white paper either contributed by the individual community members or organized by the topic groups. Now we are at this stage, we have draft um, frontier report. We also have a draft of topic group reports. Here you can find all the draft report at this, our webpage. You can click the link, you can see the snapshot look like this. We have the report itself and have a link for you provide the community feedback. So please do so during this week, you have no time to attend our session. Of course, the major material will be presented in our plenary and uh, parallel sessions this week, okay? So we we'll also have dedicated parallel sessions to discuss our report. Okay, so start with uh, what will happen this week about uh, I So we start with two plenary. So first one will happen Wednesday afternoon is detector technology for next decade. Basically, this is a major session for instrumental frontier to present our key message. The technology, the needs, uh, key technology needs and R&D uh, needs. Okay, so we, we, are, we are not too, sorry. We will not present by 10 uh, topic group, uh, groups, but we organize roughly three big areas in applied physics, cosmic experiment, neutrino and intensive experiment. We just try to organize our uh, major information from 10 topic groups into these three major areas. So this is the first most important session for us to share our key message with you. The next uh, plenary will happen on Sunday. This act is in parallel to, unfortunately, with DEI session, I believe the uh, overlap is unavoidable. This is called Korea in Detecting Instrumentation. In this session, we'll have a list of excellent instrumentation lists come to present their work. Uh, this, of course, the list of the presenter are at the different career stages. So it's a very interesting you go there to listen to what they are working on, what they're planning for the later stage of the career, okay? So after this particular session, we are co-organized with CPAT. So we end up a panel discussion with um, workforce development and collaboration with industry because particularly some of these uh, uh, issues are very unique and important to use mentioned from here, okay? So by the parallel session, we we'll basically we have 10 parallel sessions, one by each topic group. So this session will basically, uh, the, the format will be a varied between different topic groups. They, we've let the topic group decide they want to focus the report uh, discussion or technology highs, so highlights. So basically please go there. So uh, Monday we have basically the quantum sensor and the photon sensors. And the Tuesday we have um, sort of the tracking, uh, TDAC, uh, calorimeter and the radio. And the 20s, we have basically electronic ethics. And the 22nd, we have basically MGTD and uh, noble, uh, noble elements and uh, cross cutting. So we also have during the week, we have the three dedicated sessions to basically work our report with the community. We start with Wednesday, we introduce our report first. Basically, uh, we present our uh, uh, frontier report, also each subtopic group we present a key point of their report. Then later of the, the week, we sorry, we st start to take the input. We start to refine our report, and the, basically last session we basically trying to sharpen our sharpen our key message from the report. Basically produce the key message, the key key point from from instrument frontier. What we want basically, uh, you know, as the end of snow mass report, what we want to produce for the community. Okay, so please come 
enjoy this session if you know as you can. Okay, there will be several important uh, cross frontier IF sessions. Uh, as few early speakers already mentioned, or will be participate in the community in getting the uh, frontier feedback. So then there will be two work with underground facility. One is the quantum science technology. The other is cross cutting facility. Okay, there are also two dedicated work with RF and EF. One is, you probably know the timing information for future detective developments become very critical information. Okay, so that's also one uh, work with uh, EF, IF basically the work of the detector MDI information. So there's also another two we code uh, co co uh, organized with uh, neutrino, neutrino frontier and the cosmic frontier is mainly concerned the instrumentation for neutrino frontier and the dark matter technologies. This is one of the other. So basically we all three frontier all work together to develop the schedule agenda for these two. Okay, this is the, the important uh, cross frontier sessions. Okay, I think this is my last slide. We decided not to present you a summary, but the, since we were asked by the uh, committee, uh, which tell you how to participate. So uh, we took one of the pair chart pre, no, present, uh, prepared by the local organized committee. This is the registration information for all of you here, your primary, primary frontier you choose when you do the registration. You can see, no doubt, all the you know, major scientists, your interest in your science, okay? Instrumentation frontier is here, it's only few percent. But we do believe most of you, if not of you, are interested in instrumentation because we all need a detector technology to, to our physics. So we hope, please come to IF meetings, comment our report and contact with us and our topic group, uh, the sub conveners. So we all together, let us sharp, sharpen this particular message. You know, it's, indeed there's a strong need of much increased technology development in prepare for next big steps while we actually, you know, working on the current development field. Thanks. So thank you very much for uh, keeping on time even. So uh, the, the next speaker is, uh, is Elizabeth Wooster who's gonna be talking about the neutrino frontier. I have one uh, uh, quick message for the Zoom people is we still haven't figured out how to show the speakers on Zoom, but apparently people are working on this and they are very good. So they will solve the problem somehow. Thank you. So I'm uh, being, be, presenting on behalf of the Neutrino Frontier. I don't know how to work this. I'll just do it this way. I also can't do it this way. Oh. <laughs> okay. All right, so just hit it hard. Okay. All right. So. Uh, the Neutrino Frontier Organization, Patrick and Kate and I are the Frontier Conveners. We're all three here in person this week, so you can grab us. 
Uh, we have 10 topical groups, each of which has like three to four front, uh, topical group conveners, as well as liaisons to all the other frontiers and the early career organization. So it's more than 40 people, so it's not very practical to list names, but they've all worked very hard and uh, you can find their names and all other sort of neutrino frontier information here at the wiki. I don't know how to do this. I don't know why I can't do it. Click on slide. Ah, there we go. Yes, perfect, thank you. All right. So we've had some major themes that have emerged from our frontier and I'm going to tell you what they are because then I'm going to organize my tour of our sessions uh, around these concepts. So a defining and I think somewhat unique aspect of the neutrino frontier is breadth and balance of efforts across a very wide range of physics topics, timescales, sizes and costs with a significant need for collaboration with other frontiers and across the boundaries of what is typically considered particle physics. I'll come back to that. Uh, physics beyond the three neutrino standard model is emerging as a major focus of the neutrino frontier, and this can include investigation of anomalies in neutrino oscillation measurements, precision measurements of neutrino oscillation that might be sensitive to new particles and interactions, and also the use of neutrino experiments to search for other new physics that may or may not have anything to do with neutrinos, things like dark matter. Uh, use of neutrinos as messengers carrying information about otherwise inaccessible systems, particularly as participants in multi-messenger astronomy, is a growing area of interest. Dune LBNF, of course, is the largest project in our portfolio, and there's extensive investment from the United States and international partners to make these precision neutrino oscillation measurements, as well as a broad program of astrophysics topics and beyond the standard model searches. So this process that we're part of right now will be particularly focused on the second phase of Dune, which is necessary to achieve the full Dune physics scope, and which also offers opportunities that we're really excited about to expand the physics scope beyond what was initially envisioned in the last SNOMAS P5 process. There's significant synergies with other frontiers, particularly in detector, accelerator, and computing development. Computer community engagement is critical for our success, and early career scientists are at the heart of everything we do. So tomorrow we have a general meeting in the morning. Uh, and one of the things we'll do in that meeting is to set the context for future plans. We'll hear brief summaries of the major ongoing US initiatives. There's a vibrant ongoing neutrino program that won't get a lot of focus at this meeting since we're focused on the future, but we will hear about that stuff tomorrow. So we'll start off with a frontier business and logistics type of, of session and uh, feedback. And then we'll have talks on the current program uh, a speaker from SBN, the picture here is an event display from Icarus, so this is a real new mu interaction in Icarus. Um, a speaker from telling us about NOVA, which is making long baseline oscillation measurements, and this is a plot of their latest result of sine squared theta 23 versus delta CP, so they have this sort of uh, uh, allowed region. And then uh, somebody who has the very hard job of explaining all the different low energy neutrino stuff that's going on in the field. And sort of as an example of that, I've plotted, I've shown here the prospect uh, data comparison to prediction. And this is in, um, in bends of distance from the reactor. And so you can see that, you know, there's not any evidence for, for oscillations there. It's fitting very well with the no oscillation model. Oh, I should also say that we'll have an hour talking about Dune. We'll have a report from CD1RR from one of the Dune spokes. I think Gina will not mind if I say that I heard that went very well and that we're on track. So that's the spoiler for Gina's talk tomorrow. Uh, and then a sort of general Dune overview. And then we'll have some open discussion in the town hall. A word on nuclear physics. Some core aspects of the neutrino frontier science drivers are traditionally outside the scope of particle physics. So as an example, neutrinoless double beta decay is being stewarded by the DOE Office of Nuclear Physics and they're planning a ton scale experiments. But from a scientific perspective, we feel it's important to consider all aspects of neutrino physics together. So things that have traditionally been considered part of nuclear physics are included in our sessions and reports. And these are the parallel sessions that we'll have on these kinds of topics. There's one session that has a little bit of a scheduling snafu. I apologize for that. One out of how so many is not so bad, but I do apologize to people who are interested in this one. Keep an eye on Indico, it's probably gonna be updated. Physics beyond the standard model. Of course, neutrino mass is already behind the standard model, but um, uh, other BSM physics is emerging as a major focus of the neutrino frontier, thanks to some anomalous measurements, these very large sensitive detectors that we have to build and creative theorists. So there's a lot of activity in our sessions on BSM physics. 
Astrophysics and cosmology is another big topic. Studying neutrinos allows us to learn about a wide range of environments. And because they interact so weakly, we can find out what's going on inside of things in a way that we wouldn't be able to with any other messengers. So things like stellar fusion processes, supernova explosions, nuclear synthesis, the origin of the highest energy particles ever observed, all of these we can get information about from neutrinos. And then conversely, cosmology is sensitive to a number of things about the, the particle physics, the number of neutrinos, the sum of their masses, potential new interactions. So we have a number of sessions addressing this. I should probably also say I'm only listing neutrino frontier and sort of officially neutrino frontier cross frontier sessions. I'm sure neutrinos will show up in cosmic frontier sessions that I, I didn't include in the slides. So Dune. Uh, Dune will address many of the outstanding questions in neutrino physics by precisely measuring the parameters governing long baseline neutrino oscillation in a single experiment. It has a broad physics program beyond three flavor oscillation physics, including multi-messenger astronomy and astrophysics and searches for a wide variety of BSM signatures and precision standard model measurements. So as an example of the precision oscillation physics that will be done, this is a sensitivity plot from Dune. Uh, this is sine squared two theta one three versus the CP violating phase delta CP. And the curves here are 90% confidence level measurements that we'll be able to made, make with increasing uh, Dune exposure. The yellow blob here is the, world best fit as of a few years ago. So Dune will be built in two phases. Phase one consists of two far detector modules, a 1.2 megawatt beam from Fermilab and a minimal near detector. And with this, Dune will be able to do a mass ordering measurement, an early measurement of delta and other oscillation parameters. So this plot here is the sensitivity to detect CP violation, which means to measure that delta is not equal to zero or pi as a function of exposure in years for some staging scenarios. And so the green curve here is phase one if we never did anything else. And you can sort of think of this plot as a proxy for sensitivity in general. So then phase two doubles the far detector mass, doubles the beam power and upgrades the near detector so that we can handle systematics in a way that allow us to take advantage of that increased statistics. And that's really necessary for the precision measurement goals. And there's also potential, as I mentioned, to expand the physics scope as part of these upgrades. So this phase two, which is shown in the, the red curve here in this sensitivity proxy plot is a focus of the neutrino frontier and snow mass. And so we have a number of sessions about Dune, including some, many focused on, on what we can do in phase two. All right, over the past decade, there's been an explosion of new techniques and technologies for producing and observing neutrinos, which is you know, not the easiest thing to do given their cross sections. Uh, these technological developments will likely impact other fields directly, and there are particularly strong synergies with dark matter that people are excited about exploring. Uh, developments in accelerators and underground facilities are other areas with significant cross frontier synergies. And you, there's so much of this that it broke my slide format and I had to put all of these on the, on the next slide. Community engagement. So discourse with other scientific disciplines, a diverse and welcoming environment within HEP and education and outreach all facilitate the kinds of collaborations that are necessary for success, I think across the whole field, but maybe especially in the neutrino frontier because we have so many of these connections. Uh, and we believe that a cohesive ATP wide strategy, particularly to address issues of diversity, equity and inclusion is critical. We have four sessions uh, coming up this week that are presentations by early career members of our community. Most of our parallel sessions are focused on strategic planning. We didn't wanna to try to reproduce another neutrino conference here. And, and so these early career presentations represent the only opportunity for contributed uh, neutrino frontier physics talks. Thanks to Jacob Zettelmeyer who led this effort and to all the early career members who have curated abstracts and will be chairing the sessions and will be presenting in the session. So if you want real like nitty gritty physics talks, go to see these guys. All right, we have these afternoon plenaries like all the other frontiers. So on Friday, we have the Neutrino Frontier Colloquia where we'll talk about the big picture neutrino science. The oscillation physics, uh, three flavor and beyond will be given by Mark Messier. Beyond the standard model physics and neutrino experiments will be Andre de Gouvia and neutrinos and astrophysics will be Kate Schulberg. So this is where to get sort of the big picture of the science that we're excited about. Then actually earlier in the week, we have the semi-plenary, which is Neutrino Frontier Connections, Progress and Plans. So the first half of this are talks on physics topics where there's particularly strong connections across frontiers or to nuclear physics. 
So we'll hear about neutrino with double beta decay and neutrino mass from Joe Formaggio, neutrino interactions from Kendall Mann, and beams and instrumentation from Josh Klein. The second half of this session is called Projects and Plans. And so this is mostly a panel discussion. We'll start off with an overview of neutrino frontier projects from Joe Licken, but then the majority of this will be a panel discussion with frequently asked questions about our big projects and about projects in, in the frontier in general. And we'll have um, a very distinguished panel, including one of the Dune spokes and the, the Fermilab director will participate there. So that should be really interesting. All right, so we are supposed to tell people how to get more information and how to um, offer input. So we had this Neutrino Frontier Colloquium series in the spring in April and May. And I think that this provides an excellent summary of the physics of and with neutrinos that goes into a little bit more detail than we'll be able to in the plenary session. The recordings are available online and, and very well worth your time if you want to learn more about neutrino physics. So the, these are all links um, that take you the Indico. If you go in the minutes, there's, there's recordings. The neutrino front here, here town hall tomorrow will be an open mic. We have nothing planned for that hour other than just hearing what people have to say. So anyone from any frontier is welcome to, to share questions, comments, concerns, suggestions, words of wisdom, good jokes about neutrinos, whatever you want to tell us, please come and do that. And then the Neutrino Frontier Report exists in various forms. We have a draft executive summary. This is where we focused most of our sort of um, work on defining the message. So this is available online at this link and there's a feedback spreadsheet. So if you have comments, you can enter them there. We have a work in progress draft of the full Neutrino Frontier Report. That is not posted at this link yet, but it will be probably in a couple of days. We're working on that. And the drops, drafts of the topical group reports have been available for several months now, and we've had several rounds of feedback within the frontier. Those are all uh, at this link. And again, there's a feedback spreadsheet where you can um, let people know if you have comments about those drafts. All right, just a few remarks. First of all, huge thank you to all the topical group conveners, frontier liaisons, early career participants and liaisons, the local organizers at this meeting, and really everyone who's put in a lot of work to prepare for this meeting. Uh, we have, as I just told you, a very full slate of Neutrino Frontier organized sessions, but we're really looking forward to attending the other Frontier sessions and finding out what y'all have all been up to. And we encourage the Neutrino Frontier folk to do that as much as possible. And conversely, the sessions we've planned are generally not overly technical and we welcome attendance input and discussion from everyone. So please, please feel free to come to any of these sessions that interest you. Uh, we're excited about the physics of neutrinos and the many connections that we've identified to other areas of particle physics and the larger scientific community. And we're looking forward to spending this time together to develop a common message. Thanks. All right, thank you. And, and all the speakers are doing great, just as incentive for future speakers. And now we're gonna take a break from work plans. And we're gonna hear about the early career vision from Julia Gonski from Columbia. And hopefully we'll get the slides up as quickly as we can. Make sure I have the same, I don't have the same problem as before. Okay, very good. Okay, great. So thank you for, for the quick introduction. My name is Julia Gonski. I'm a postdoc at Columbia University. Um, I'm also the early career member of the BPF Executive Committee, and it's in that capacity that I will be giving a quick update on the SNOMAS Early Career Organization, the highlights of what we've been working on over the past couple of years, and our plans for the community summer study this week. So usually when I start talking about snow mass early career, I give a really quick motivation as to why we're doing snow mass. I'm gonna skip that because of course you're all here listening to me, but there is one point that I wanna make up front that will motivate everything else that I'm going to say about early career organizing in this process, which is to highlight this quote, which is from the snow mass quickie. And in particular, the very last part of this, that we're trying to develop a strategic plan for US high energy physics and particle astrophysics that can be executed over a 10 year timescale in the context of a 20 year global vision. 
And those numbers I think are really important because it reminds us that it's crucial to have the early career community involved in this entire process, the, the physics input, the decision-making, the execution. Um, the number one priority, before I get too deep into the organizational aspects of this, is the physics side. Of course, if there's going to be some new future experiment, we need to have buy-in from the early career community. So we need to do a good job collecting uh, the ideas from those people, making sure that they're, they're involved in the physics studies, they're involved in the physics conversations and attending the right physics sessions and, and engage in the white papers, but also to educate the next generation. So it's kind of a back and forth between the senior and the, the more junior aspects of the community. For those of you that have built one of these existing huge international experiments, we need to know what you know in order to get this done for next time. Um, so, so that's also an important element of the physics process. But in addition, I think that we've, one of the coolest things that's come out of early career engagement in SNOMAS and in HEP in general is the spotlighting of issues that are of particular interest to the early career community. This is a population that's really interested in making sure the community is functioning well and that it's equitable. And I think there's a, a nice opportunity to have an active discussion of issues and topics that are relevant to the early career community and build our community accordingly to be hospitable and, and ready to be furthered by, uh, by the next generation of physicists. So with that motivation in mind, I'll give the overview of the SNOMAS Early Career Organization. We are a group of early career physicists that were brought together, uh, you know, it feels like many years ago by now in the beginning of the SNOMAS process. In previous SNOMAS iterations, this was called SNOMAS Young. We have matured to SNOMAS Early Career in that time. The original call for early career interest in being a part of this process was in April 2020. There was a huge amount of, of feedback um, from early career people wanting to step into that. Hundreds of names came up. And then the organization I'm about to describe kind of came up organically from that group of people based on what was of interest um, to those, uh, to the early career people. The definition of early career that we will use is approximately 10 years from the highest degree guideline, so that keeps it generic to um, PhD holding scientists or engineers, technicians, various degrees of um, education. This is a really rough guideline. We are not trying to exclude anybody from, from being considered an early career scientist, but it does help to put a little bit of context to the types of physicists that we are referring to. And I mentioned this organic structure that came up and was driven by the earlier uh, DPF executive committee members that there are now two arms of the SNOMAS Early Career Organization. There's the SNOMAS coordination side, which really pertains to the early career liaisons for each frontier. I think almost all of the frontiers that we've heard from so far have mentioned their early career uh, liaisons, which is fantastic. And I'm really glad that that was a structure that worked well. Then there's also this core initiatives aspect of early career organization that is uh, kind of tangential to the SNOMAS process and pertains more to these community types of issues that I was referring to. And that's what we um, may have some continuity on after the SNOMAS process ends. So very quickly to give the highlights of those two arms, the early career coordination originally started with a structure of about one to two early career liaisons for each frontier. Sometimes those have rotated or, or you know, there's been a bit of a sinusoid in, in participation there, but we've tried to keep some consistent contact with early career folks and the frontiers across the process. Um, general kinds of roles would be to engage with early career people in each frontier, make sure they're involved in uh, the submission of LOIs, the writing of the white papers, the physics activities, but then also to liaise with the frontier leadership to disseminate relevant information to the early career people in, um, in the community. And I wanna point out the SNOMAS early career community also maintained a list of LOIs that were submitted or had contributions from uh, early career uh, scientists in the very beginning. There's at least 150 in that spreadsheet. Um, I think that must be a gross over underestimate because this was just um, something that you could submit to as you were submitting the LOIs. But I just wanna highlight that amount of early career leadership that's actually happening in the LOI process and continues to happen through the development of the uh, final product here. Then the core initiatives, Joel mentioned all four of these up front uh, in this morning session, survey, diversity, equity, and inclusion, in reach and a long-term organization. The purpose of these were to connect people from different kinds of physics on these issues that are of relevance to everyone in the community. Um, also to organize and advertise resources. So I know the DEI group, for example, had organized um, some recommendations on how to uh, select frontiers for future snow mass processes um, and make sure that, that the aspects of the development of this organization that can serve early career physicists are being highlighted. And then finally, the long-term organization aspect is one of the key things uh, that I'll mention a couple more times in this talk, which is to segue this existing structure and enthusiasm into some longer term cross subfield structure for early career uh, physicists to continue to work together on things like this. And it had come up in the very beginning of this idea that we wanted to be prepared for the next SNOMAS process. So looking quite far down the line, but not having to do this uh, complete restructuring and creation of organization from scratch like we did in 2021. 
So a couple highlights from the work of the core initiatives throughout this process. The survey um, was dispatched to everyone, early career and senior scientists alike, collecting opinions on a variety of different issues, careers, physics, workplace culture, COVID. Um, there's a nice bit of press here from the Fermilab News if, if you wanna take a look. The synthesized results of this will be discussed in the SEC plenary, that will be Sunday. I'll give more details on that in a couple more slides. DEI, I already mentioned the recommendations that were put together by SEC for uh, the organization and the selecting of people to serve in leadership roles in Snowmass. There were also these DEI town halls that happened in collaboration with Community Engagement Frontier, just giving a couple examples of some of those that happened in 2021. The main activity of the in-reach uh, aspect of, of the core initiatives was this big questions colloquium series, which really was fantastic and took off, I think, really remarkably, trying to tackle topics that were maybe centered around each of the frontiers or centered on um, the objectives of the SOMAS process. Uh, I've given a couple, a couple examples of these also on the slide. There's a whole YouTube channel where many of these have been recorded and are uploaded if you want to, um, to look back. And that's been pretty consistent for nearly a year and a half now of, of hosting these. And then finally, the LTO, there was an LOI submitted on the long-term organization in the community engagement frontier. The white paper, I'm told, was submitted to the archive maybe yesterday, so I think it really it will be posted very shortly. Um, so there is a complete fleshed out proposal for this. And then uh, there's a, a, one of the aspects of this that we may be able to continue is this Big Questions colloquium series, maybe tweaking the, the topics or the speakers a bit to spotlight early career scientists. There's a nice example of this having happened um, in AAS with the head seminar series. So that's one of the options that um, that we're considering and that we'd like to get feedback on from, from all of you while you're here. So our work plan, nobody asked me to make a work plan, but I really like that structure. I like the idea of having some, some core objectives that we'd like to accomplish, uh, given that we have this opportunity uh, to be here in person or mostly in person in the same Zoom room. Uh, and so these are just four points that I, if we could achieve all of these things, I would say that it was very successful from an early career standpoint. Um, one, I keep coming back to the fact that the, the first thing we should focus on is physics. So understanding the physics input from early career scientists, amplifying that so we know that whatever clever plan we come up with at the end of this, there will be people there to execute it and that they're interested in doing that. Um, but also making sure that we're providing a good educational opportunity to any variety of students, postdocs, people who are, uh, who are newer to the field who haven't had the, the decades of experience in constructing and building these plans. Facilitating also discussions on these community kinds of issues and also getting contributions from uh, all elements of the community to making sure that these are being advanced and they're being discussed and that we are all committed to trying to address these issues. Um, I'll give a couple examples of those that are also being highlighted in the early career schedule. Additionally, the long-term organization for early career uh, scientists, I think would be a great thing to broach and, and collect and put on in the, in the summer study here. So collating really broad input from all the early career people that are in this room or on Zoom, but also from uh, the, the senior side that may have input or ideas on this. And then finally, the, the social aspects of this, because it is maybe one of the, the first in-person opportunities we've had in a long time. I think networking is so important for early career people who are coming in here and maybe have not been seeing the same people for 10 years and 10 years in different snow mass processes. Um, so building working relationships, finding future colleagues, co-authors, and dare I say befriend, <laughs> getting to know people on just the social context. Um, and I think those would be really uh, advantageous to have also coming out of the CSS. So our schedule uh, that I hope is kind of in line with those four uh, principles of the work plan, even just in this morning's sessions, I've noticed a lot of uh, really cool early career focused uh, physics sessions or different networking sessions that are not even on this list. Um, so I didn't have the time to update the slides, but this is just a very quick rundown. Tuesday evening, there'll be an early career networking event with industry partners. There will be an informal social event on Wednesday evening, um, about a 20 minute walk from campus. And then the lunch sessions on Thursday and Friday, I wanna point out Thursdays will be a conversation led by early career physicists on mental health, invisible disabilities and neurodiversity, which would be great to get broad attendance at. And then Fridays, there's an early career panel organized in collaboration with community engagement. I've been told by the organizers that this is a proper panel discussion and not just speaking time for the panelists. So I think if you have any kind of questions or suggestions or thoughts, I would be, uh, I think it'd be great to bring those to the Friday lunch session. And then the SOMAS Early Career Plenary, I have screenshot of the agenda. This will be Sunday from two to 3.30. There are a variety of talks here, uh, a couple that are focused on the long-term organization aspect, and then the results of the SOMAS Early Career Survey. I think there's a lot of really good material in there that um, if you're interested in these kinds of issues or would like to uh, participate, there'll be good opportunity for discussion in that. So I'd encourage everyone to join. Then last, the long-term organization. Um, I wanna give a couple goals and a little bit more information about this, because again, this is one of the things that I'd really like to get broad input on um, from everyone in this room during the next week. 
So if we segue the existing structure towards a long-term organization that is sort of initialized by SNOMAS, but substantiated, maybe has rotating leadership, it survives over um, you know, potentially the next 10 years. Uh, I've mentioned already the LOI and the white paper. The goals would be to foster a general cross subfield community, um, act as a representative group. So the kinds of things that I've been saying that we've already been trying to do for SNOMAS, but just in continuity. Um, there's a potential for us to act as an advisory body to officially an, an APS or DPF in some capacity. I think that's up in the air and again, would be uh, very welcome to, to have more input on which direction we should go in terms of uh, the home of such an organization, providing an early career structure to the future SNOMAS processes and lots of networking opportunities and continuing to make sure that everyone is engaged and connected. And I am a firm believer in, in everyone being engaged leading to us doing better physics. So I think that there's a lot of uh, really nice ideas that can come out of this. And the discussion on this will be held during the SEC plenary. So if you have thoughts on this, please join and, and make your voice heard. So with the conclusion uh, that there is a, I think there's a very motivated early career community. Um, everyone has been also thanking the, the frontier uh, leadership and participants in the course of these talks. I would like to underline also that I think the, the early career people that have kicked this organization off have been very inspiring, really motivated to, uh, to follow up on these issues, to make sure that this is an inclusive process and that we have a nice future laid out for us for the field. Um, that's through the contacts with each frontier on the physics side, but also through these core initiatives that really just came up out of the vacuum. Um, I think it's even more, more impressive when you consider um, that this didn't exist before SNOMAS and the potential for a long-term organization to keep all that really nice momentum going. I also wanna thank the organizers for this, uh, for the whole community summer study that I know went out of their way to make sure that there were financial resources and that we were considering bringing early career people into this conversation, which is important to getting any of this done. I think there's also been an advertisement of APS membership while we're here. I just wanna highlight that uh, this is particularly a great resource for early career people, students and postdocs in the audience. The first year of membership is free for students. Um, that's how I got into APS and I'm, I think I've been on an APS committee ever since. So uh, it's a really nice way to get involved. And last, I did just make a new Slack channel, CSS Early Career for news, discussion, conversation, chatter, anything else, um, anything early career related. So please join that if you haven't already and you'd like to be part. Thanks. Right, uh, thank you, Julia. Julia. So the, the next speaker is uh, Andy Lankford for UC Irvine. He's running down the stairs. And his title was uh, to be decided, but he's gonna give us uh, an overview of the experimental landscape of particle physics uh, today. Okay, I can see where my uh, subtitles go. All right, I um, couldn't think of a better title for the talk, so I left it as the experimental landscape. Uh, I'm gonna give you a whirlwind tour of the current program. Uh, I'll explain why. I'm glad to be here, but let me first thank all my colleagues who kindly provided me with material for my presentation, and especially to the program managers at DOE and NSF. Oops, wrong way. Okay, here's my outline. Um, you know that P5 will be charged to develop a strategic plan for the US particle physics for the future. The starting point for the future, of course, is the, the present program. So the outline of my presentation is to make some general comments about the program. Then the body of my talk will be an overview of the experimental program. I'm gonna organize it according to the 2014 P5 science drivers. Then I'll make some closing remarks. And what I'd like to accomplish in this presentation is to convey the diversity, the richness, the balance of the current experimental program, its broad science scope, covering the great range of different but interrelated topics, experiments with a diversity of sizes from the small to the mega projects, that it's part of a global program of collaborative international efforts and shared facilities, and that while P5 prioritizes projects, it does so in the context of the science drivers and of the program as a whole. 
It puts together an entire program. And recall that what P5 stands for is Particle Physics Project Prioritization Panel. So one of the messages, maybe the central message of the 2014 P5 was that particle physics is global. And so our current program is guided by this 2014 P5 report, uh, Building for Discovery. This report said that, that we should pursue the most important opportunities wherever they are and host unique world-class facilities that engage the global scientific community. The reason why it said that is because as you'll see, you go through the SNOMAS exercise and you learn what's going on and all the different frontiers, you'll see the vast number of questions. And then if you were to sit down as a member of P5, you'd see that we don't have the resources to address all those questions. So the idea is together that the United States and major players in other regions can together address the full breadth of the field's most urgent questions. If each hosts a unique world-class facility at home and partners in high priority facilities hosted elsewhere. And because of this, the US experimental program depends upon reliable partnerships. We've already seen P5 science drivers um, a number of times uh, this morning. What P5 did was it distilled a big number, uh, I think Joel called it 11 different questions developed by uh, Snowmass last time. Actually, each of those questions had sub-questions and the total number was an order of 30. The, um, from all those questions, P5 uh, distilled them down to these five science drivers and then used these drivers to help motivate a program for the next 10 years within this 20 year vision. So I'm not gonna run back over these drivers since we've already been over them and you're gonna see them unfold in my talk. But P5 emphasized that these five science drivers are intertwined. For example, think about the synergy between precision physics and direct production of new particles. Or think about the insights that cosmic surveys shed on neutrino properties. Given the, the science drivers, P5 then identified the highest priority projects for a balanced program that addresses these science drivers in constrained budget scenarios. Now, I don't have time to cover much in this talk, so I'm unable to cover these foundations of the experimental program. But the experimental program is built upon the foundations of other critical research activities, theory, technology R&D, both in the accelerator area and in the detector area, on software and computing, which includes these days, artificial intelligence and machine learning. Um, also these days, DOE and NSF support theoretical and experimental quantum information science uh, research as part of the program. The experimental program and its foundation cannot exist without its expert science and technology workforce as well. As I said, it's unfortunate that I don't have time to go over all these things, but we'll see them all here at SNOMAS. So to the drivers. One of the drivers is to use the Higgs boson as a new tool for discovery. The LHC and the HLHC are the only means to produce and characterize the Higgs for the next decade or longer. Precision measurements of Higgs properties can be made there leading to, in, to measurements at the level of a few percent and you can look for deviations at that level. In addition, there'll be access to rare processes like uh, H to mu mu. So here just as a you know, symbolic a representation of uh, Atlas Higgs measurements uh, with the existing data set. And uh, these will of course improve as the data set increases. Then the ILC, the FCC or any other Higgs factory in the future would eventually allow measurements of higher precision and complemented by a very high energy proton proton collider, which could be the FCHH or some other, uh, would allow other improved measurements, particularly Higgs self-coupling. So this is sort of the view of the uh, last P5. We have to evolve this view to prepare for the next P5. So US, the LHC and the HLLHC. You must realize that the LHC has been one of the largest investments of the US in high energy physics ever. There was a inv significant investment into the construction of the LHC accelerator by DOE into both ATLAS and CMS by both DOE and NSF, uh, to LHCB by the NSF, as well as uh, some from uh, DOE nuclear physics, and then the, the Alex, ALICE detector funded by DOE nuclear physics. 
The U.S. is the single largest collaborating nation on both Atlas and CMS. It makes up about 19% of Atlas and about 27% of CMS. And the U.S. also plays leading roles on LHCB, where there's six U.S. institutions participating. And one must not lose sight of the LHC Detectors Operations Program. It's funded by both DOE and NSF. It supports the maintenance and operations of the experiments, uh, the U.S. contributions of those. Also, the um, software and computing for the experiments, and it's been spearheading the HLLHC software and computing uh, planning and R and D. I want to say a few words about the LHC and HLLHC upgrades. Of course, the last P five had a recommendation on that. It said, uh, following the recommendation, that the LHC upgrades constitute our highest priority near term. It says under that. Uh, so phase one upgrades were installed during this recently completed long shutdown two, and they're now uh, involved in run three that started just uh, a week ago. Now, of course, the U.S. investments continuing for the HL LHC upgrades for run four. And for that, there again is an accelerator investment in the HL LHC accelerator upgrade project. Uh, that project officially can commence construction at CD3, December of 2020. Uh, it'll be rebaselined this year for the impacts of COVID and the change in the overall LHC schedule, uh, in particular for long shutdown three. Then there's the DOE and NSF supporting the HL LHC, sometimes called phase two upgrades of both Atlas and CMS. Again, a substantial NSF investment. Uh, the MREFC started in, uh, Funding started in February 2020. That's like the construction start on the uh, NSF side. And then the, uh, the baselining on the DOE side for Atlas and CMS will occur this fall. But both experiments have already received uh, early construction start funding uh, as well. So this outlines the schedule uh, from uh, for HLLHC starting with this long shutdown three when things will be, uh, upgrades will be installed and then going on for run four, run five, and then uh, on uh, up to early 2040s. And you can see here the uh, peak luminosity jumping up in two stages through that period. And this is the increased integrated luminosity. It leads to something of the order of seven times the integrated luminosity that will be there at the end of run three, which is, let's say, twice what it is currently. Now, LHCB is also undergoing upgrades in two stages, although the timing's a little bit different. Their uh, first uh, upgrade is installed in LS2 as the phase one for the others, but their second one will be not in LS3, but in LS4. I'll show you transparency on that. And I just want to mention uh, in passing that the European strategy for particle physics, physics update highlighted flavor physics at the LHC and HLLHC. This is the uh, HLLHC accelerator upgrade uh, project. In, it, on this transparency, you see all the different uh, upgrades taking place in the machine and highlighted are the, the DOE contribution to the niobium 310 superconducting quadrupoles for the interaction points and the, the superconducting crab cavities also for the interaction points. Here's the CMS HL LHC upgrade. And I obviously not gonna go through all the detail on this, but just look, it's. Look at the scope of this upgrade on nearly everything. And then in the red boxes are the US contributions on nearly everything. Uh, same, same story on Atlas. Uh, here for LHCB, showing both upgrades one and two, this, is, um, this figure here shows the vast number of upgrades were in, that were in upgrade one and uh, are there for run through, mostly there for run three. The US contributions there were to the uh, GPU trigger application and triggers for inclusive heavy flavor and for the dark sector. And here's a uh, photo of the upstream tracking detector where the US was involved in leadership role there. There is a upgrade 1B, which involves some uh, low momentum tracker stations inside the magnet there. And then for upgrade two, which would be here for this uh, out here of LS4 for the last two runs of HL LHC. A new vertex detector, 4D vertex detector, and a 5D calorimeter. And this is where US R&D is taking place. 
Now there's been uh, planning for the future beyond the uh, HLLHC. And I wanted to mention here, this, uh, there was some, some, some guidance included in the 2014 P5 plan. Uh, it advocated supporting development and realization of the ILC. Uh, focusing uh, there, the investment's been focused on the SRF uh, R&D, both for high gradient and high Q. And it also talked about R&D towards a very high energy PP collider and pointed towards uh, work on the next generation high field dipoles, which has been organized in a new program called the US Magnet Development Program. So advancing colliders of the proposed size, scale, and complexity requires intergovernmental discussion and global coordination. So there, there's been a concerted US government interagency effort during the last five or six years to support moving forwards with a proposed ILC in Japan and to collaborate with CERN on a proposed FCC on, on both of those. DOE coordinates with the ILC international development team to prepare ILC for its pre-lab phase and DOE plans to participate in any future intergovernmental discussion with Japan and global partners, and to uh, participate in the international R&D program that Hatoshi Miyama mentioned this morning that may be initiated. Uh, in 2020, DOE signed an FCC agreement to continue R&D and participate in the FCC feasibility study. Now, I wanna note that current efforts for ILC and or FCC focused primarily on accelerator R&D. However, DOE grants for the LHC experiments may apply up to 25% of their funds for development and physics studies for experiments for future colliders. And of course, there are other collider concepts being considered now during the SNOMAS P5 process. And uh, these um, concepts in the SNOMAS discussions will guide future US R&D investments in this front. Moving on to another driver, pursue the physics associated with neutrino mass. And here P5 said, in collaboration with international partners, develop a coherent uh, short baseline and long baseline neutrino program hosted at Fermilab. And there's a lot of activity, uh, as uh, Elizabeth already said, on the uh, neutrino frontier, as it's called. Excuse me. Um, there are a number of experiments working abroad. There's a little bit of color coding here. Uh, Blue, as far as I know, is supported only by DOE. Green is, as far as I know, only supported by NSF. And purple, I know, is supported by both. So the, here are experiments where the US is working abroad. Um, the, here's the program now at uh, Fermilab, uh, on short baseline Minerva Microboon Icarus, on the long baseline Nova. And the future there moves to, on the short baseline, the uh, uh, SBN short baseline neutrinos is SBND near detector in Icarus and a long baseline LBF and F doom. And then there are these other, there's these other experiments here in the US at other labs of various sorts having to do with uh, neutrinos. So the short baseline neutrino program as suggested by P5 had two principal goals, to resolve the experimental anomalies in the major neutrino spectrum, including the search for sterile neutrinos, and secondly, to demonstrate the liquid argon TPC detector technology that Doom will be using. There are three detectors in this program. There's Microboon, whose physics running is complete. It's published its first results on about one half its uh, data set. And you can see some of those down here. This is a summary of results on uh, electron neutrino appearance. Altogether, at this point, Microboon's produced 47 papers, and about half of them are in physics, and about half of them in R&D papers, um, matching these two principal goals of this program. Icarus was brought from Grand Sasso, uh, went via CERN for refurbishment, and is now operating at Fermilab. And SBND, the short baseline near detectors under construction. This sketch here, what you see is the uh, neutrino beam for the short baseline. Uh, SBND is off here to the right, not shown. Here's where Microboon is sitting. Uh, mini, this is where Miniboon is located. And finally, at long, at longer, but still in a short baseline, the Icarus detector. Here in a nutshell is the long baseline neutrino program, the uh, long baseline neutrino facility in the deep underground uh, neutrino experiment. Here you know that uh, Fermilab produces uh, 
protons, they hit a target, makes neutrinos that go underground to a detector in the Stanford Underground Research Facility. LBNF Dune, although it wasn't called LBNF Dune by P5, was identified as the highest priority large project in its time frame. It's become the centerpiece of a US hosted international neutrino program, uh, now consists of more than 1,100 collaborators from nearly 200 institutes in 32 different countries. And uh, this international science facility hosted in the US uh, has gotten the strong support within the US government. Another comp important component for the neutrino programs, the Proton Improvement Plan 2. It's a 1.2 megawatt proton, proton beam on target. Uh, it, the beam should be, will be ready when LBNF is ready. Uh, it's also an upgradable facility. It's going to support the research goals beyond the neutrino program by providing increased beam power and high reliability to future Fermilab experiments. It is also being built with international partners, quite significant international uh, uh, participation in this project from India, Italy, the UK, France, and Poland. And here's conceptually what this looks like uh, with the, uh, the uh, superconducting RF accelerator gallery there. The ultimate goal for the proton complex at Fermilab is to have more than two megawatts on target uh, with a booster upgrade to follow PIP2. Another driver was to identify the new physics of dark matter. Here P5 said it is imperative to search for dark matter along every uh, feasible avenue. And the four complementary experimental approaches they each provide essential clues, direct detection, indirect detection, observation of large scale astrophysical effects and uh, dark matter production accelerators. And I'll say two words about each uh, for indirect detection. The research continues now in our program with Fermi Lat and uh, AMS. The Hawk experiment sensitive to very heavy dark matter particles. DOE has no new initiatives in indirect detection planned at this point. This is just an icon of showing rotational curves that remind us large scale astrophysical effects can uh, give us insights into dark matter. And I'll say more about that in uh, a little bit later. Direct detection searches for dark matter is one of these avenues and P5 recommended a second generation dark matter program with three complement. Well, it suggested the program outside of P5, uh, NSF and DOE work together to define uh, the program. And it consists of three complementary experiments. There is the ADMX axion search uh, here at University of Washington. Uh, here is uh, a plot with its latest results. The reds are earlier results uh, from as early as 2017. The greens, the newest ones. You, you see how the sensitivity here pushes into a new region and uh, beyond that of uh, pre-existing uh, data. The LZ detector is located at SURF, where Dune will be located. Uh, it's a WIMP search using liquid xenon. Uh, it had its first results this year. Uh, these were already uh, flashed here. I think it was by Hitoshi. But you, you see them pushing the limits down beyond previous experiments already at the beginning of their uh, run. And then the uh, third one is um, the um, Super CDMS Snow Lab. I'm sorry, it's hidden under there. Uh, it's a DOE NSF physics partnership. It's again a WIMP search, but uses silicon germanium detectors. It's located at Snow Lab in Canada. Uh, its fabrication should complete uh, at the, by the end of this year and it will be operating in 2024. And in addition to these uh, larger experiments, NSF supports numerous uh, other direct detection searches, uh, which I've listed here. Some of these are participation in large experiments and some of them are small experiments. The 2014 P5 also recommended one or more third generation experiments. So one of the lines of investigation is at accelerators. The uh, dark matter production can occur at particle colliders. There are many dark matter searches at the LHC in both Atlas and CMS and also LHCB. New, there's a new experiment uh, phaser uh, in the forward direction near Atlas. That, that's what's shown here. There's a wide variety of uh, signatures, different searches 
you know, at the LHC. And we've just categorized these as in ones invisible signatures, such as that the traditional uh, 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 mono Z signal or things like that, uh, or visible signatures where there's some dark mediator going to some signal like digest. And of course, so the searches in the SUSE context as well. And this is a program that will continue uh, at the HLLHC. And in passing, I also want to comment the Babar and Bell have been uh, publishing results on uh, dark matter searches. You can also do dark matter production in intense particle beams. A lot of thought going into that now, but these early experiments is the heavy photon search at uh, JLab, and it was uh, preceded by APEX. And more recently at Los Alamos, there's the coherent Captain Mills experiment or CCM10 was the first generation uh, looking in a neutrino, in a neutron beam. Uh, this experiment also is uh, used uh, in neutrino studies. Now, as there was on the frontier, uh, on the energy frontier, there are, uh, on the cosmic frontier, there's effort going into new concepts. And the new concepts are under study in the context of the dark matter uh, new initiatives. So for instance, here are two of these, CCM in a 200 version or LDMX. So as I said, this planning has been going on for a while there. There was an important workshop in 2017 that looked beyond WIMP dark matter and axion dark matter, many other sorts that could be investigated. And then recently this dark matter new initiatives, it ended up funding uh, development of six small project concepts, four that are cosmic frontier projects and two on the intensity frontier. That's those two, I believe. Another driver is to understand cosmic acceleration, dark energy and inflation. Uh, first on dark energy on this slide, uh, there are their complementary imaging and spectroscopic surveys. Uh, we're transitioning from stage three, which cons consisted of EBOS, which has now published its final results, and the dark energy survey, where the, that survey is complete now. The data processing from the vast data set is nearing completion, and the studies will go on for quite some while. We're transitioning to stage four. Stage four consists of DAISY, the dark energy spectroscopic instrument. Its data taking started in 2021. Unfortunately, it's been interrupted recently by a fire. Uh, here we see its focal plane and the Mayo telescope on which it sits. Now, uh, we also have the Vera C. Rubin Observatory at stage four, which uh, now does the legacy survey of space and time, which captures the old uh, acronym LSST. The LSST CAM was a DOE project, it was completed in 2021, and it moves to Chile in 2023. Uh, it's a uh, both a DOE and an NSF funded project. Uh, the data, um, the dark energy science collaboration has been formed and is planning the science on it. And the data taken there should start in uh, late 2024. Another component uh, is to study inflation is the cosmic wave background. Uh, here is the stage three South Pole telescope. Uh, it, it is taking data now, again, a DOE-NSF partnership. It had its first science results uh, symbolically represented here in 2021. And now one's planning for the next generation, that's CMBS-4. It was recommended by both the 2014 P5 and Astro 2020 as a DOE-NSF partnership. CMBS-4 uh, had a concept definition task force report in 2017 and received its DOE uh, mission need CD0 in 2019. Uh, unfortunately, we learned just earlier this year that, that uh, the as is currently being designed, CMBS4 exceeds the uh, infrastructure that can be supported at the South Pole. It's going to have to be shrunk some. And uh, P5 actually suggested international collaboration and coordination on this stage. And finally, there's a new, very new initiative, Lucy Knight. It's uh, with NASA. Lucy Knight's a Pathfinder mission for, uh, to look at the dark ages signal on the lunar far side. Uh, it's uh, funding started in FY22 and for a launch in 2025. And it's gonna measure the low frequency radio sky sensitive to the 21 centimeter emission from hydrogen at very high redshifts. So you 
greater than 30. The last driver, not the least important, P5 did not prioritize these science drivers, is explore the unknown, new particles, interactions, and uh, uh, gosh, see, what's, what's hiding under there starting with a P? <laughs> Physical principles, thank you. Some approaches to exploring the non outli non outlined by P5 were high energy colliders, he'd done direct searches, uh, precision physics and rare processes, a number of those, and you can see the experiments in our program that are looking at those. And here are a couple that weren't explicitly mentioned in P5, looking at time reversal invariance, searches for monopoles. Uh, I also mentioned cosmic particles, where we see a large number of experiments, many funded by NSF, that's the green, remember. Uh, and remember the synergy between looking at these cosmic particles and the NSF program in multi messenger astronomy. And one can also look for new low mass particles, for instance, hadron spectroscopy, where LHCb has been outstanding of late. At, at the high energy colliders, one searches directly, and here what you just see is uh, the latest results for Atlas heavy particle searches. Uh, the limits you can see uh, exceed one TV, and some of them uh, go up exceed 10 TV. And those, again, that's just with the existing data set. The HLLHC uh, have up to 40% larger discovery reach. One also explores the unknown with precision measurements. And some here are some of the major experiments there. Uh, we collaborate with Japan on K meson, heavy quark, and tau lepton precision uh, studies with the Kodo experiment in Bell 2. There's LHCB at the LHC who does numerous precision studies. And uh, here you actually see a, uh, a plot here that shows the synergy between LHC direct searches for electric quarks and the B physics anomalies where this sort of diagonal pie shaped thing is the region favored by those anomalies if they're caused by electroports. And there's the Fermilab uh, muon program. Their muon G minus two experiment has published its results from its first year of running. It now has 19 times the data set of its BNL predecessor from five years of running and that's under analysis. The MUDE experiment is still under construction that started in 2016. It needs a read baseline for recent impacts that take place this year, and it's targeted to start its run in 2026. I'll just go past that because uh, I'm running out of time and close now. So the US particle physics program has been guided over these last years by the strategic plan put together in the 2014 P5 report. It's time for an upgrade because the 10 years of that is uh, sunsetting. The plan was motivated by five intertwined science drivers. What are some of the characteristics of that plan? It's science driven, it's broad, it covers a great range of different but interrelated questions. It's a balanced program. It's not a strict prioritization. P5 did not strictly prioritize projects. It chose ones that fit into a balanced portfolio under each of budget scenario it was given. And finally, it's part of a global program of international collaborations and shared facilities. The 2023 P5 plan will build upon today's experimental program that I've uh, given you this tour of, and it'll build upon the, the projects that will soon complete. Uh, this, the Snowmass Community Summer Study that we're involved in now is going to provide the new information upon which the P 2023 P5 strategic plan will be built. So let's assemble a plan that shares the strong characteristics of the 2014 plan. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, so we're back to the work plans. Uh, the next speaker is uh, Bob Bernstein from Fermilab, and he's going to tell us about the rare processes and precision measurements uh, frontier plan. Okay. Yeah, can everybody hear me? Yeah. 
Okay, cool. All right, hi everybody, thanks. Um, I'm gonna be talking about the rare and precision frontier, the status and our goals. The three co-conveners are me, uh, Marina Artuso at Syracuse, and Lexi Petrov at Wayne State. So let's see, does that work? It's not advancing. There we go. Okay, so what's the rare and precision frontier about? Um, it's about the origin of flavor, about generations and a mass hierarchy. Why are there flavors? Why are there generations? We really don't have a good answer to that. Uh, it's about the physics of the dark sector that's available at high energy machine, high intensity machines. These are well-motivated and powerful timely probes. You've heard a lot about them today. We're about the origin of fundamental symmetries and the breakdown mechanisms. Baryon and lepton number violation, electric dipole moments in CP, fundamental symmetry tests. And we're also about Hadron spectroscopy to understand QCD better. Uh, we're also about the theory that enables and guides these experiments, especially for us, effective field theories in the lattice. Experimentally, there's a big landscape. There's a, we generally use precise measurements and or rare processes to search for new physics, like muon G minus two, like CKM tests, like the B anomalies, like EDMs, like CP violation. And I don't want anybody to take any specific entry in this table literally, but what I want you to see is that we, we tried to categorize a bunch of you know, internal drivers and the experimental landscape that we're dealing with and we're looking at over the next couple of decades. And you see it's really big and really broad and that everything connects with everything else. And that makes it a little bit difficult. We're so broad and we're so general and we touch so many things, it makes it a little diffuse. So we talked among ourselves and we really thought, you know, if there's one thing that's not getting across is that we think the physics of flavor and generation to the extent that we have a unifying theme is the unifying theme of our frontier. We actually think that should be a new P5 driver. Okay, why are there generations? Why, why three, why not 11 or 17? You know, we haven't understood this since the discovery of the muon. So it's not like it's an unimportant question. You know, what the origin of flavor is, it's a common theme across much of the frontier. Another thing is that much of our frontier is small and medium scale experiments, which I think everybody believes have to thrive in the US ecosystem. You know, they're good for early career researchers, they're good for the frontier, they're good for all particle physics. Okay, so that's, that's sort of the speech. Major meetings, we have two major colloquia, one on Wednesday, which is simultaneous with the neutrinos. I realize some of this is covered up. Stefania Gori will talk about understanding dark matter and dark sectors. And then something which I'll talk about more later is that we realized that there was a lot of overlap between us and things going on in atomic molecular and optical physics. And so there'll be a round table about that. The second colloquium will be on Thursday. Uh, Bill will be talking about standard model precision tests and new physics and heavy flavor. And Vincenzo will be talking about the search for new physics, the questions we can address with leptons and quarks. And then on Tuesday, um, there'll be an overall report discussion. So anything you don't like about what I said, come and tell me then, or in the hallway, um, come and tell us what you think should be in the report, but that's what that's for. So for the structure of this talk, you know, rather than writing it myself, right, or ourselves, we, we went to the top of the groups and said, okay, we want all of you to do three things. What are the major physics questions in your frontier, in your working group? What's your status and your plans for snow mass? And sort of what's your ask from P5, right? What do you want P5? What do you want from the DOE? Boil it down and give us a bullet point. So our plan for snow mass is for further community input at the meetings and to the draft white papers, and I'll point you to that leading to, like Tim said earlier about the cosmics, the frontier report after snow mass. How do you participate? Come to the meetings. I'm gonna name some key meetings in the talk, but nobody can go to all of them. Um, so I've included those that are especially recommended by the subconveners. There are links in the PDF to each of the topical group reports. Many of the people in this room have been involved in writing them, but the links are here. You can check where they are, or you can contact the subconveners or the conveners and the last page of this talk is an email list of, every, of all those conveners and subconveners. So the first topical group is weak decays at B and C, Angelo DeCanto and Stefan Marnell. Um, I think everybody in the room knows about how rich and diverse this field is. Here's an update of uh, the 
the anomalies of, I think, 5.3 sigma from this morning. Um, there's promising hints of new physics from the V factories and LHC, you know, in many, many different channels. The status and plans for snow mass. So here's the overleaf link. On Tuesday, there'll be a presentation and a discussion of the draft report. On Thursday, there'll be a cross frontier session with the energy and theory frontier on the anomalies. And the ask for P5 is, is you know, we really want to point out flavor is crucial to our search for physics over the next two decades. And the next 10 to 20 years, we'll have a you know, really exciting program of across multiple machines. And we should pursue this. The US should not let this be a second class subject that's, you know, well, after we do everything else, we really think we should focus on this and aggressively pursue this for physics and provide continued and stable support for the theory community. Strange and Light Quarks, Evgeny Galdovsky at Birmingham and Emily Passamart, Indiana. Um, precision measurements of Ks, hyperons, pions, etas, eta primes, CKM parameter and unitarity tests, lepton flavor number, lepton universality tests. And this is where CODO lives, right? And the US is not big in CODO, we're not big in NA62. Um, you know, another thing we want to point out is that new physics in the B sector, you know, implies new physics in the Ks, in Ks or pods. Right, all these things motivate new searches in other, in other sectors. Um, that's enough on that. Status and plans for snow mass. There's the overleaf link. There's a meeting Tuesday at, seven, uh, at 10 in the morning about the uh, report. For P5, this is a real medium scale kind of thing, right? So the medium scale initiatives, many are centered in Europe and Asia. There's short time scales that are ideal for early career physicists who are waiting a long time for machines to be built. Um, one thing we thought was, you know, we really should make up our mind about things like red top, which have been around since the last the P, since at least the last P5, and we ought to settle on what we're going to do there. Next group is fundamental physics and small experiments, Tom Bloom and Peter Winter. Um, they're looking a lot at EDMs, CP violation. There's a really interesting opportunity, which we need to think about, about storage ring uh, proton electric dipole moments, which could be built at Fermi Lab. Um, the magnetic dipole moments is, of course, you know, very interesting with G minus two. And here I want to say a little bit more about the AMO uh, HEP overlap in searches for fundamental symmetry violation. Um, and, uh, you know, really, this is new to snow mass for us. We share the physics. As we talk to these people, we share a lot of the physics. And, we, you know, we can't just blame other agencies for stovepiping. We have to look across funding boundaries and our own personal training and think about how do we do the best physics here. So status and plans, there's the overleaf link. Wednesday, there'll be a round table on this. Friday, there'll be a parallel session to discuss the storage rings. Aida will be talking about standard model predictions um, for the anomaly. And P5, you know, think about storage ring EDMs, try to figure out a way to cross some of these um, funding boundaries and think about that all of these need small scale experiments in the ecosystem. Baryon and lepton violating processes, Pavel Perez at uh, Case Western and Andrea Pokar at, at UMass Amherst. So everybody knows that B and L violation is important for matter antimatter asymmetry, proton decay, anti uh, neutron anti neutron oscillations, and neutrinoless double beta decay. A lot of this is shared with neutrinos. Um, these address the specific effective field theory for the standard model. Status and plans there's the overleaf link. And as I said, there's a lot of overlap with the neutrino meetings. So there's the neutrino with double beta decay meetings. There's a precision beta decay meeting, things like Pioneer Sunday morning, a cross frontier meeting on Wednesday morning. And for P5, I mean, the thing is we talk among ourselves is to start to break down the HEP and key divisions for experiments like neutrino with double beta decay and neutron anti-neutron oscillations. You know, it's the same intellectual problems, it's the same methods, it's a lot of the same people, and the separations are in the way of the physics, and we should think about how to do that. Charge lepton flavor violation, uh, Sasha Davidson and Bertrand Eschenard. So the physics here, you know, is, is our interactions that don't conserve lepton family numbers in charged leptons. So they're very related to the neutrino and energy frontier searches. Plans for snow mass on Thursday, there'll be charged leptons in heavy states. Friday, so that we have a plan, which I'll talk about a little bit more later, for a staged developing muon facility at Fermilab 
to talk to look at charge left arm flavor violation and other muon processes. And I hope you come to that. I'm really excited about that. Sunday, we'll have a, a cross session with our neutrino friends and talk about those connections. Status and plans, there's the overleaf link. Um, please read it. And we are gonna talk about, about this new program quite a bit. Um, and we really think the next generation of these programs this is an essential component for a global program. And we hope that P5 recommends the design of a new muon based program with a submission of an actual program to the next P5. Dark sector at high intensity, Stefania Gori and Mike Williams. You know, we talked about dark sectors a lot, so I'm not gonna go into that in super detail. Intensity frontier experiments offer unique and unprecedented access. They organize their reports into big ideas. There are some of them, there's the overleaf link. And there'll be a presentation of the report Wednesday morning, a cross meeting with energy on Wednesday and an all frontiers meeting on Tuesday. P5, milestones in the next decade to promote US leadership, to exploit the large multi-purpose detectors like Bell 2 and LHCB, um, invest in fully funding the DMNI that Andy just talked about, and to extend it with a focus on visible dark sector decay signals. And they really want people to support theory efforts, especially those in collaboration with experiment. Our last uh, working group is Hadron Spectroscopy, which is Rich Chavez and Tomasz Stanicki. This is, this is really interesting stuff. I mean, you know, we know about conventional QQR and QQQ combinations, but there are all these, there's just this multiplicity of states. Are they molecules? Are they diquarks? Are they tetraquarks, pentaquarks, hybrids? What are the dominant mechanisms for their structure? You know, you're really trying to probe what the nature of QCD is and can we actually calculate stuff. And new states are being discovered every year. So this is really interesting. And what do they want? Um, there's the overleaf link. So they don't want their own machine, but what they want is research group funding for spectroscopy and relevant detector upgrades. The new thing they really want, and people have done this in other, in other, dis, in other studies, is a sort of a cross theory experiment consortium, okay, which has worked very well in a number of cases. Um, and they could cross the high energy nuclear divide. So summary, um, there's a really frontier wide strong consensus that the physics of flavor and generation should have greater emphasis in the US program with theory support. And we think there should be a new driver for us. Um, the US needs to decide on a portfolio. There's 75 of these, if you look at the report, the accelerator dark matter experiments. So we need to boil that down to a set that are well-motivated, unique, and affordable. Um, and, and our report will address that. Uh, a new muon program at Fermilab using PIP2 would you know, we're talking about anywhere from 250 kilowatts on up would enable physics and flavor, charge left on flavor violation and left on number violation. And finally, our frontier and our discipline need small and medium scale experiments to be a thriving part of the US ecosystem. Okay, done, thanks. All right, thanks, Bob. So next we're gonna hear from the theory frontier and it will be uh, Shu Feng Su from uh, the University of Arizona. Thanks everyone. So I'm here to present the work plan for the theory frontier. And you might be wondering where is our big conveners who are Chapa, Nathaniel, and Aida. They are spending every last single second they have to finish the frontier report for to, to ready for the discussion on Saturday. Okay. And if you also wonder what this logo is, because I did, when I first look at the slide that Chaba gave me, I said, hey, what is that thing? I only see the loop diagrams, which are the final diagrams. And he said, if you not see, it's a snow mass. And I was like, 
Huh. Yes, it is snowmass, which is cool. So the credit goes to Fripp. He actually designed that for the snowmass, but end up it's not taken. So the Siri Frontier take it as our logo. Okay. So unlike the other work plan report, we always define like, hey, you know, what our frontier is about. And when I come to think, what is our Siri frontier about? Or ultimately, what is Siri about? I was like, uh huh. You know, it's, it's kind of like everywhere and, you know, goes from the, the beginning to the end. And then what is really serious about? So last, a couple of days ago, when I'm here in, in the Ann Nelson, in the workshop in honor of Professor Ann Nelson at UW, and someone told me, Anne once said, the theory is about what is possible. And uh, I think about that, it actually echoes with me a lot. I mean, theories definitely is no lack of ideas or the not from normal ones to the really weird ones. And uh, we, we are, but not only just ideas, we also think about how to test them at experiments. And uh, lots, of, lots of us did all those bread butter physics to make the comparison with the experiment results possible. We basically goes up it goes all the way from the beginning to the end of all the experiments when after the hard hard working of the experimentalist when they finally present the results to us that theories can handle we think about how to interpret them how to kill some of the ideas or how to stimulate new ideas so the theory is really kind of uh, everywhere so these are the three people who are still working <laughs> and uh, we have uh, 11 different frontiers because really there are so many things to cover and if you look at some of them, some of them might look very familiar, like I'm part of the kind of phenomenology, which is relevant for the energy frontier. And there are also ones relevant to the neutrino frontier, the one that's relative to the cosmo frontier. But if you look and also lattice QCD, of course, part of us, very, very important. And the precision measurement QCD physics and things. But if you look at this, so one thing which is, I think, unusual for this snow mass is we also include very formal theory, which typically are not part of snow mass. If you look at the previous few snow mass over there, all the formal theory, you probably won't see, you know, many of the string theorists over here. But this time uh, we are glad that they actually joined the snow mass activity as well. We have uh, the string theories, the black holes, and the, you know, CFTs and the, Q the, the formal QFTs over here. So I think this time, even the theory frontier, we've been quite inclusive and in trying to cover many different aspects of the theoretical studies. And uh, yeah, we of course have uh, new liaisons with the different frontier over here. Laura connect us with the energy frontiers and Irina and Babu with the neutrino frontiers, uh, Fripp who designed the logo with the cosmic frontiers and Alexi with the, the real processes. Lian Tao is our connection with accelerator, uh, accelerator frontiers, Stephen the computation nodes and the Devon with the community. And I apologize, we actually don't have one foot that uh, designated for the early career ones. I'm sure there are lots of early career people in the theory frontier. And here is what, the, what we have, the activity for the next couple of days. Each of the, front, uh, the topic groups have our own parallel sessions. And uh, on Wednesday, we have basically the astro and the neutrinos. Oh, I need to mention, those parallel sessions are not meant for the theorists to, to talk to ourselves. We already talk to ourselves a lot, okay? So those uh, parallel sessions are actually more focused towards outfacing is for us to talk to people from uh, other frontiers, experimentalists, accelerated people, all the, the, uh, all the other frontiers over there for you to come and hear what's exciting in the theory community, what are the latest development, or just tell us what you need from us. It's really meant to be a communication of the theory frontiers with the rest of the communities over here. And we have tell every single speaker of us, please make your talk accessible. Don't lost people in the first five minutes. So please, please come to our parallel sessions. Okay, so yeah, I already mentioned the Cosmo and the neutrinos. And then on Thursdays, we have the EFT, which have been used quite a lot recently you know, in the Higgs coupling uh, fit and things like that. Lattice QCD certainly is a big piece of it. And then things we have so many, we have to double up our parallel sessions. <laughs> on Friday, we have the TF4, the scattered amplitudes, doubled up 
with the precision and the kind of phenomenologies. And on Saturday, we also have the, the BSM quantum information doubled up with a more formal side. So now you really need to pick who are the theorists you want to talk to. Okay, and we also have a bunch of uh, cross frontier activities. I encourage everyone to go to this uh, CEF once, the community engagement. And then with the energy frontier, we, ha uh, we have uh, the one on Tuesdays, which I'm part of organizing. We have a really exciting program over there. Yes, so please come. And then we have the one with the dark matters, the one with the flavor and the real processes. And the uh, quantum information, yeah, I think this, uh, this at least is the latest one, as you heard in this morning, the time time in the room might be changing. So please keep track of this one over here. And then we also have the one with uh, about the hydrons, cosmic neutrinos and uh, ultra high energy neutrinos. So we have a bunch of programs. I think that's a problem we are facing like which parallel session or which session to go to. Okay, so the primary ones, uh, we have a bunch of uh, lattice QCD talks about in the particle physics and also in the nuclear physics side. And these are almost mission impossible for the theory plenaries to give a half an hour talking about what's excitement on the theory side. So we'll see how Shamit and Jesse make this the mission impossible work. <laughs> Okay, and how to, and yes, we do have the topic group report at least up there for comments. You can find them over here. If you have a comment, you can have it over here. The frontier group report, unfortunately, is not out yet, but Chaba promised that they will have that ready for Sunday, for this coming Sunday TF discussion. So they have one week to get it ready. If you want to talk to us, uh, those are three big conveners. And for all the, the rest of us, the email can be found over here. There will be a two hour discussions in a week about our topic group reports and the frontier reports. So please, please, if you're interested, please read the, the many, many pages of <laughs> reports. But if you don't have time for that, at least read the executive summary of that. That should have all the highlights of our reports. And again, feedback and uh, join us for the Slack channels. I think that's it. All right, thank you. So uh, the last speaker for this session before the coffee break is uh, John Orell from PNNL. And he's gonna give us the work plans from the underground frontier. Thank you very much. All right, my name is John Orell from Pacific Northwest National Laboratory. I am here representing the Underground Facilities and Infrastructure Frontier, or UF for short. Uh, I'm here on behalf of our co-conveners, Lower Botus, Peter Hall, Kevin Lesko, and myself. What are our objectives and goals for the underground facilities and infrastructure frontier? Identify the science programs performing research in underground facilities, and then collect information on existing underground facilities and infrastructure. This is a supply side of the issue. We collect in current and future needs for science in underground facilities. This is the demand side of the equation and then compare the two to come up with a gap analysis. What are we missing in terms of the facilities and infrastructure that we need in underground facilities to support the science programs that people are planning? Ultimately, we want to take this and analyze it to generate a recommendation for an integrated strategy for underground facilities and infrastructure. The way that we'll do this is through the organization of the frontier itself. We're uh, broken up into several topical areas. I'll go through these just briefly. There is underground facilities for neutrinos. And so this is a direct connection to the neutrino frontier. Underground facilities for cosmic frontier. This is really direct detection dark matter. And then there are two here, supporting capabilities and synergistic research. Supporting capabilities is all of the other things that you need to be able to do science and underground. 
supporting the science in the neutrino and cosmic frontiers, for example. This is including things that are underground, as well as things that you need to perform underground science, even if it's located above ground, uh, developing instrumentation and, and the like. Synergistic research is really looking at all the other things besides particle physics, high energy physics that's done in underground laboratories. It gives you a sense of the breadth of work that is being done in underground facilities, as well as identifying if there are other users of the same facilities that we are sharing space with, sharing infrastructure with, those should be included in our thoughts about uh, the final thing here, which is coming up with an integrated strategy for the facilities and the infrastructure that we need to perform the science that we've studied here. All right, so we have a number of sessions that are focused at the topical level for underground facilities and infrastructure. Uh, they're listed here, Tuesday, Wednesday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday. And these are really intended to be uh, readouts of the status from each of the topical working groups uh, for underground facilities. Uh, you'll hear about the status of the reports and as well as we hope to gain feedback from the community on what is needed for facilities, infrastructure related to underground facilities. And so this is an opportunity for the community as a whole to hear the status of our reports and then provide input back in terms of what, uh, what is needed or what is missing. We also have cross frontier sessions planned and I'll just describe these in a little bit more detail. I'll go through each of them. Uh, the first is a uh, cross frontier between underground neutrino and uh, rare processes. Originally, this was intended as a, a, a focus on neutrinos del beta decay, but as the program has evolved, this has gone, become to include uh, other sources of neutrinos, astrophysical neutrinos as well. Uh, so it really is a, a full look at uh, neutrino science underground uh, with the exception of a focus on long baseline neutrinos and underground facilities on Thursday. So you can see that the uh, neutrino uh, frontier in underground science in underground facilities is split up into uh, these two Tuesday uh, and Thursday uh, uh, cross frontier sessions. We also have a Wednesday uh, cross frontier session between uh, underground and uh, uh, instrumentation. Uh, here looking at quantum information science, uh, quantum science and technology uh, and uh, future uh, instrumentation that might be going into underground facilities. This is an idea that has just come up in the last several years. And so we're holding a, a forum uh, on this, uh, this topic uh, on Wednesday. Um, on Saturday, uh, we have sort of a walk-in plan to try to capture all of the things that have happened during the week. This is where we hope to get, gather up people who've been thinking about, okay, we've decided what science we wanna do. We think we know what it looks like. How do we build it? We hope to be able to capture that, the instrumentation, the facilities, the infrastructure that's needed for underground science, uh, gather that up on Saturday. We do have colloquia planned uh, Monday opening for us. This is one of these uh, half uh, uh, plenary sessions. Uh, in this session, it is really an, an overview of underground facilities, the science that's being done today, as well as the future as seen by the underground uh, science facilities. Uh, the first speaker will be Jarrett Heiss from the Sanford Underground Research Facility. And he'll be telling you about the plans uh, for science uh, at SURF. And then Clarence Virtue from Lawrence University will be presenting an international context. Uh, there are multiple underground facilities around the world. Uh, we'd like to understand what those facilities are planning on doing and what their outlook is as well. Then on Friday, uh, our full plenary session here is again a readout of the status of reports from the underground facilities uh, frontier. Uh, we'll be talking about the needs for neutrino and cosmic frontier science and then looking at the supporting infrastructure and synergistic research associated with underground facilities. And then a, uh, uh, an outline of these uh, strategy for underground facilities uh, for future science. To engage with us, uh, really it's helping us identify uh, facility and infrastructure needs for your underground science. Please tell us what you need. It goes into our documents. This is how we build the structure of our, our documentation. Um, we really want to document what is required to implement the science programs. This is critical, as I said, you've decided what science you want to do, you think you know what it looks like, 
how do you build it? That's where it comes in uh, on the ground facilities. Uh, and really to engage with us at the topical level in our, with our topical conveners is how to get that information about the needs for facilities uh, into the SNOMAS uh, reports. Our reports are in draft form. I think it's important to note that uh, the underground facilities is really draws from the other frontiers. Uh, our reports must, be consist must consistently reflect the science needs of the other frontier reports. We'll be looking at the other frontier reports and ensuring that we, we have in our reports is consistent with those plans. And the facility infrastructure content from the other frontiers can find a home here. So again, it's this, if you know what science you wanna do and you think you know what it looks like and you wanna build something in the underground, it can find a home in uh, our reporting. So at our uh, uh, sessions, you'll see previews and draft conclusions for underground uh, facilities infrastructure reports uh, during the sessions this week. Uh, so in summary, uh, Underground Facilities Infrastructure Frontier supports the execution of science from other under frontiers, most notably Neutrino Frontier, Cosmic Frontier, Rare Processes, and Precision Frontier. For us, SNOMAS here in Seattle is key uh, for establishing consistency with requirements stemming from the other frontiers, outlining and communicating the status of our reports to you and getting feedback, and then drafting recommendations in the context of everything else, else that we hear presented at this meeting. So I hope that you will join us to catalyze the future of underground science. Thank you. All right, thanks. Yeah, and, uh, and, and thanks again, all the speakers for being uh, very economic with their times. So we earned a little bit of a longer uh, coffee break. <laughs>